Listen to the voices of the advocates. Clive Grossman KCSC is a renowned barrister with a diverse background in both criminal and civil law. He began his career in the then Rhodesia in 1967, where he practiced until 1983. He then joined the Hong Kong Legal Department, where he worked in the Prosecutions and Civil Division. During his time in the public sector, he rose to the position of Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions and Head of the Commercial Crime Unit. We enjoyed unpicking his fascinating life and career, and we hope you will too. Let me start first by saying to Clive Grossman, SC, thank you very much for being with us here on Advocates, the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, and I believe I'm the one who's honoured. Thank you, Clive. Clive, we begin these interviews traditionally by asking you to tell us a little bit about your your, your background and where you came from, and, and yours is incredibly colourful. So tell us about that journey from Hackney to Rhodesia. Well, I was born in Hackney in 1940. That was exactly two months before the Blitz started in London. We were bombed. We got by our houses were bombed. And my mother took me to a place called Macclesfield in the north of London. So that was the first couple of years in, uh, of my life. I was born in 1940. And then came back to stay with my uh, grandfather in Dollis Hill in London. And then eventually when things got worse by the V rockets, we went back to the north of England, and I still remember some of that. In fact, I went to a junior school there. But we, we went back home eventually in 1945. And before we just we touch on, on how the family moved to, to Rhodesia, one thing that struck me was um, your father's experiences during the war. I understand he was one of those who actually um, uncovered, if you like, Belsen Bergen. Yes, he was in a battalion that prepared the way, prepared roads and things like that. Um, I can't remember at this stage exactly what it was called, but he told us, he wouldn't talk about it much apparently, but eventually he told us, his commanding officer said to him, Sergeant Grossman, don't see what this terrible smell is over the horizon there. So he took a platoon and they walked into Belson concentration camp. It was so ghastly, so awful, he found it difficult to speak to it about it. But he said there were bodies lying all over the place. Some were dead. Most were dead. Some were dying. And he saw one German officer in the distance, and he shouted at him to come over. And it, this man just ran towards them, stepping over live people, dead people, stepping on them. And my father shouted at him and said to him, why are you treading on these people, you know, what are you doing? He said, oh, they're, they're only Jews. Well, my, we're Jewish. So my father shot him. And the people who were laying there on the floor, the ones who were alive, they couldn't believe it. You know, this was somebody shooting a, 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 a German. And my father had the Jewish mug and dovid, as we call it, the Star of David around his neck. And he could speak Yiddish, which is a kind of uh, kind of German, and he could communicate with them. And he said it was obviously the most devastating hour of his life. That Wow. Incredible. And after the war, I don't know whether that, that uh, was one of the reasons you did this, but uh, the family moved to, to Rhodesia. Yes, well, the British government at that stage were encouraging white people to go to the colonies. And my father couldn't think of a place further away from the horrors of Europe than this little country with no border, or bo the border, no border on the sea in the middle of Africa. In those days, not many people had heard of it. And so he and some of my mother's family and his family went by, by ship, Langibi Castle, I remember that. And we arrived in what was in Southern Rhodesia in 1947, the end of 1947. And what are your first memories of, uh, of Rhodesia? Well, I was seven at the time, you understand. Uh, we were put in 
some kind of uh, camp for people newly arrived. It was very, very small. I remember we shared one room, the four of us. My sister was born by then. And we shared outside toilets and we shared a, uh, we shared a kitchen, etc. But there was food like I, we'd never seen before. I was suffering. Nobody will believe it now, the way I look, but I suffered from malnutrition as a child. <laughs> now I don't, let me tell you. <laughs> I suffered from malnutrition. And there were strange foods like bananas. Apparently, that I'm told the first one I ate, I was given one, I was trying to eat it with the skin on. <laughs> and, you know, food, in the, food during the war had been very rationed, but there was no rations there. So we could eat what we liked, you know, plenty of meat, which I'd never seen before, things like that. And where we lived was a place called Cranbourne, and it was big open fields nearby, something also I'd never seen, you know. And I only have happy memories of those days. And we moved around for a while, but I had happy memories of it. So schooling in, in, in Rhodesia, what drew you from there to the law? Well, I went to school and I went to high school there till I was about 16. I had, I think, the ability to go to university, but my parents couldn't afford it. My father had been a, a carpenter and he never very successful in holding down a job. And he had a, a friend who was a lawyer, a solicitor, who said he would take me on and I could study uh, while I was working for him. He said, my father... You know, if he goes to university, he'll just get drunk and change, chase girls, which I have to do, say I did some years later. <laughs> he said, you know, don't worry about, uh, I'll teach him everything. So I worked for a solicitor for about three years, didn't like it, but I studied a lot, got my, what we call the A-levels, uh, high school certificate. And then eventually this man, who was very friendly with my father, said, look, Sorry, I have to tell you, Clive will never make a lawyer. Maybe he was right, who knows. But um, he, 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 uh, by this time, I'd saved a little money. And then I worked for a year uh, in the government as a clerk in one of the ministries. Uh, and, but, I then had to, but during that year, I had to do my national service, which was four months. And then at the end of that period, now I'm talking about the end of 59, end of 1960, um, I had enough money to go to university, and I went to the University of Cape Town to do law, which my parents, who were poor people, thought this is what a son should do. And they used to say in those days, a lawyer is a Jewish boy who doesn't like the sight of blood. So they couldn't be a... <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, Cape Town University in those days, was it, um, uh, it must have been one of the few universities in, in Southern Africa that, that, that had a law school? No, I think there were a couple of others, but Cape Town was the one where all my friends had gone. I was a bit be obviously a bit behind them by this stage. And we used to think it was, we always said it was the best law school in, uh, in Africa. And there I'd studied, I was there for five years, a three-year BA and a two-year, and I have to say, we were there in the days of apartheid, and that was always, always the big issue amongst us kind of quasi-liberals. We didn't like it, but still, I have to say, it was a marvelous university, wonderful university. And were there any any sort of professors or lecturers there that stood out for you? That Well, there was Professor Solly Lehman, who taught criminal law, and I think he's still alive, actually. <coughs> there was Professor Ben Baynard, who, was a, who was, had gone down in history there, was one of the greats. Professor DeFoss, Bota DeFoss, they, they were well-known. They'd done very well at the bar themselves, these people. So let me ask you, after university... You practiced, as I understand it, in uh, in Rhodesia. After that, yes, yes. Um, yes. But what, what was the road? What were, why did you choose the road to the bar rather than become a solicitor? 
Well, first of all, I had a grant from the government, which meant I had to work for the government for three years. And the government was, I started off as a prosecutor in the magistrate's court, worked my way up through the courts, and eventually I was working in the high court, but only doing crime at that stage, only doing crime. And crime in those days consisted of various types, you know, robbery, etc. But I was doing a lot of the murder cases and things like that. And in the meantime, so this was taking us to about 1970, round about then, I got married. My wife was born and bred in what was then the Belgium Congo. And she came down to visit a friend or a friend's parents. And the friend's parents said to my parents, uh, Kitty, that's my wife's name, she's coming down, she doesn't know anybody, would Clive like to meet her? And my parents took it upon themselves to say yes. And I have to tell you, 10 days later, we got engaged. My goodness. But I always say to my wife, well, you didn't speak English very well. I didn't speak French very well. So it's a complete misunderstanding. <laughs> and this was uh, 54 years ago. <clears throat> and we say to my children, grandchildren, never rush into anything. You see what happens? <laughs> anyway. That's why I call myself a lucky man, you see, in my, my book. Anyway, um, I couldn't afford at that stage to go into private practice, where as a barrister, I wouldn't have a, a, an independent, I'd have to earn everything myself. And one day, um, a solicitor I knew, I met him at the movies, and he said, I introduced him to my wife. And he said to me, why don't you come to the bar? So I said, oh, well, I can't afford it. He said, if you do, I'll brief you. How much are you earning? And I told him. He said, I'll give you that amount of, of uh, briefs every month. And he did. And until such time as he was struck off eventually, he, he would brief me. And I, I did very well at the bar, I have to say. It was a good time at the bar. Except, <clears throat> as I'll come to shortly, from about 1970 onwards, uh, we had a uh, guerrilla war, which we called, and I still call, a terrorist war. And as it progressed worse and worse, we had to spend more and more time in the army. And less and less time at the bar. Well, what it meant was eventually we had to do six, what they called six weeks in and six weeks out. So half the time, uh, if people who were self-employed could do six weeks in, six weeks out. What happened? I'd done national service, and I'll tell you immediately, I was not a very good soldier. I was a rifleman, which is the lowest rank. Anyway, when I came back, I still had to do national. I still had to go once a month or so to to the army to you know for weekends and rifle practice and stuff. And I couldn't re ever see myself progressing from rifleman. And then somebody suggested that I apply to the uh, intelligence unit of our battalion, which I did. And I got, became an, a sergeant there. And eventually, as things got worse, I, be, I joined the, uh, the Army's intelligence unit. And I eventually, I rose to the rank of captain. And I spent quite a lot of time in the bush fighting and things like that but it wasn't too bad I mean I wasn't a frontline soldier still from time to time we had things I don't like to talk about but it wasn't too bad being an in intelligence I was an interrogator for a while and I learned the secret of interrogation is always pretend you know the answer to every question you ask. And does that, is that what you still do at the, at the bar? Well, I do that, but they're a bit cleverer here. I'm sure. We've never interviewed anyone with, that, with such a colourful background. And I'd like to ask you, uh, you now practice in one of the most sophisticated bars in the world, Hong Kong. Yes. 
and you know PNG and Fiji as well. Contrast that with the Zimbabwe or the Rhodesian bar in those early days. Tell us what it was like. Paint us a picture. Yes, well, the Rhodesian bar, it was very, it was Roman Dutch law, but I must say it had very little difference from the way law is practiced here. We wore wigs, for instance, judges wore wigs, and we dressed the way advocates do in England and uh, barristers here do. We, we wore uh, uh, gowns and things like that. In Africa, in my time, well, until such time as uh, there was independence came and Robert Mugabe came in as prime minister, things were, uh, it was not all that different from here. It was far simpler. You know, for instance, in civil matters, you didn't have long submissions to put in or long uh, uh, further and better particulars and all that type of thing. They were simple. A civil case, even a criminal case, very rarely lasted uh, very long, um, more than a few days. But we didn't specialize, so we did whatever came along. I did a lot of crime, I did a lot of matrimonial and civil work, insurance stuff, that type of thing. In crime, the that major difference from here, and I've no doubt from Malaysia too, is this, we had the death penalty at that stage. But a person who'd been found guilty of murder could have what they called extenuating circumstances if the defense of self-defense didn't go quite far enough or provocation didn't go far enough to reduce it to manslaughter, culpable homicide, as we called it. And the other reason they had was if the murder was committed through a genuine belief in witchcraft that would also be that would also be extenuating circumstances i can give you two examples one where i defended and one when i was acting as a judge the one where i was defending was in a village which we call the kraal k-r-a-a-l once lightning came down struck a cow killed it so immediately they go to the witch doctor and say, why was my cow killed? Whose fault was it? And the witch doctor would throw bones and look around, and then she pointed in a direction and said, it was her. It was her. So it was in a, in a, in a, in a hut. And so they burned down the hut with a woman in it, killed her, and then all got on their bicycles and went off to the police station and said, oh, we've just done a great thing. We've just killed a, a witch. Anyway, they eventually get prosecuted for murder, but uh, they get extenuating circumstances because they really believed it. And the other one was when I was sitting as a judge there, as a, as a, as a judge, a man, a, a wealthy African, I remember him, he was wealthy, he was well-dressed, etc. His son became very ill and he'd taken him to a witch doctor and the witch doctor said, you've got to feed him on the lungs of a certain tribe, person from a tribe. So he went out, killed the man, fed the lungs to his son, who incidentally survived, and then came told, told the police what he'd done. Pleaded guilty to murder, and uh, of course I didn't have to sentence him to death, gave him life imprisonment. And a prison officer once told me that Prison officers, incidentally, were allowed to use uh, people who had good behaviour as uh, in their house to do, you know, the cleaning, the babysitting, and whatever. And he said, "We always go for the murderers because they're the ones, you know, actually got good, good backgrounds and things like that." <laughs> go for the the work, ones convicted of murder to look after our children. I think this is the first time we've interviewed a guest who has appeared in court and addressed uh, witchcraft as a subject. And I'm just curious about how, as a barrister, you reconcile the evidence that you got from witchcraft with the logical analysis that the law required in a case. Well, the one, the case I'm talk, talking about, there was no issue as to did they or didn't they do it. Of course, in the first one, they'd gone report, and in, well, in both cases, they reported themselves to the police. The first one thought he'd, 
you know, the thought, hey, we've done a great job here. We've really, you know, we should get a medal kind of thing. Whereas the second one knew that what he did was not wrong, but he did it for his son, and his son survived, I have to tell you. And there was no question of worrying about it. You know, we grew up knowing that witchcraft was B. Now, I'll tell you, if I can tell you another little anecdote about witchcraft, there's a small town called Rusapi. I don't know how you call what they call it now. Then it was called Rusapi. And in Africa, what we love to eat, we call biltong. It's what the Americans call jerky, beef jerky. They come from cows, things like that. Anyway, one day there was a youngster, a black youngster. He was about, I don't know, early teens, something like that. He was wandering, he was walking around the town selling this beef jerky, and everybody was saying, wow, this is really tasty. And he's selling it so cheap. Really, it's really good. So the police thought, hang on, this chap must be killing cows. We called it stock theft, which was seen it serious because it, it was a uh, you know, farmer's area. So they arrested him. Well, they didn't arrest him. They said to him, you've been, ste you've been killing cows, haven't you? No, he said. My father always told me that's a very, very serious thing. I must never do it. So they said, all right, well, where did you get all this biltong from? Come, I'll show you. They took them off into the bush and uh, in a cave. They walked in. There's a skeleton of about 10 different people. <laughs> He'd murdered them. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. <laughs> but selling, this, selling their meters. And he said uh, somebody who was a witch doctor had told him it was perfectly okay. As long as it wasn't cow meat, it was okay. Goodness gracious me, how interesting is that? Let me ask you now, Clive, we've got Mugabe, got independence, Robert Mugabe coming in as, as Prime Minister. You were born in England. Did you ever think of, at that point in time, well, look, now it's time to to head back to the uh, Pacificus Alf, uh, Al Albion and uh, practice there? The difficulty was this. We weren't allowed to export any money whatsoever. So any money we had was in Rhodesian, then Zimbabwe dollars. Uh, and in addition to that, I had a degree in Roman Dutch law. So if I went to England, I'd have to start all over again. Israel, I have to tell you, was another possibility, but then I'd have to learn Hebrew also. So that was not an idea. And then... Uh, to move to Hong Kong, what Hong Kong was doing at that stage, there were not many that many Chinese graduates from from uh, the law school, so they were recruiting prosecutors from the Commonwealth. And Rhodesia, when we were under sanctions because we were illegal, they couldn't get people from Rhodesia. And then when it became Zimbabwe, and it was, they could recruit people. And a person who, I knew his younger brother, not him, sorry, his older brother, he was here, Frank Stock, he's been already here, uh, he'd come via Liverpool, and he came to visit to bring me regards from somebody, and I said to him, what are the chances of getting to Hong Kong? And that was the start. Wow. That was the start. And I, I brought and another three of us came at the same time. Okay, let me just stop you there. We're going to come to Hong Kong in just a second. I just want to go back to the to, to the uh, the Rhodesian bar. At that time. okay, yes. Were there any particular uh, barristers there that inspired you from whom you learned? Well, we had a similar system of silks and um, junior counsel. The, the silks. There was one in particular. His name was Chris Anderson. He was as good as anyone I've ever seen, including from England, uh, to come here. He was superb. And there were other people like uh, Michael Tett, Bill Whitaker, people like that. Uh, I just mentioned their names. I, they passed away, all passed away. They're much older than me. But the standard, which I measured against here, I thought was very good. I mean, when I came here, uh, just to give an example, I was a bit worried because I thought, you know, I mean, we can't come from a small town, as it were, and this is Hong Kong full of great barristers from Australia, New Zealand, England, locally, etc. How would I manage? But I have to say, I didn't find the standard here 
was much better than in Rhodesia. That, that's really interesting to know because I think we've, we've, we've interviewed other lawyers from other parts of the Commonwealth as well. And that seems to be a general theme that, you know, we might look at Australia and think they're better there and UK and think they're better there. But really, you know, locally common in Commonwealth countries, I think the bars are, are, are generally very strong. And that, that's interesting. Let's turn to, to now to, to Hong Kong and, and when you did move there and join the bar. I would imagine at that point in time, this was, what year was that, was that by the way? Uh, 83. 83. So I would imagine at that point in time it would have been a, a very a very sort of white bar. Yeah. Yes. Well, I joined the government. You see, I was recruited by the government as a prosecutor. Uh, and I spent some years there. It was. There were Chinese silks. There were Chinese, but the majority of people were white people. There were people from Asia. And most of the judges, most of the judges uh, had been recruited from England or Australia at that time. At that time. And uh, as you said earlier, I don't think one could compare standards and say, oh, this was much better than that, or that was much, much worse than that. So um, I, I think the standard here was pretty good. The standard was pretty good. Let me ask you now about your time in the in the um, uh, DPPs. Yes, I mean you ended up as deputy director of uh, prosecution yes. in, in Hong Kong, yes. a very high uh, high position. Uh, and apart from the trial work and how you prepared for that, we'll come to that in a little while. But one yes. thing I'm interested in is how you exercised uh, that power, deciding to prosecute people. What went? What, what were the what were the factors that went through your mind? What was that last thing that had to click before you'd sign something? Put in very simple terms, and these were the instructions I had and the instructions I gave also, was, is it more likely than not that we'll succeed? That was the thing. And I expected at that stage there should be something like a 75% win. And at the end of the year, we tended to look and say, did we win 75% or around that figure? I thought it was wrong that we should win 90%. Or more, because that would mean that if you once you've been arrested, you know what's the point? You know you yeah. want to get. I thought seventy-five percent win, win was the right way to do it, uh, and that, that's 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 the basis of which we looked at every case. And can I ask you about the, sort of the corruption environment in in Hong Kong at that time? I know the uh, was it the ICAC was sort of. In its uh, in its birth uh, at about at about the time you were you were there. Tell us a little bit yeah. about, about how that IC- came. Yes, the ICAC had started some years before. Some years before, there was great corruption in the police. Some of the very wealthy people, uh, both these people, had been policemen, and the ICAC was brought in. They were independent to look at it. By the time I arrived, I have to say. Corruption was large. There was still always cases of corruption, but it had largely disappeared. Uh, and that was the general view, and that was correct. And the cases that I did uh, in commercial crime, in the commercial crime, were tended not to be so much corruption, but more fraud, that type of thing, white collar, white collar crime. There was corruption, no doubt about it, and the person. Okay, the person whose place I took as head of commercial crime, he got seven years for corruption. What he did was uh, he'd arranged with a solicitor that where the solicitor had a client who'd been convicted of something to do with commercial crime and was going to appeal, he, that is the head of, com- the, head of the uh, commercial crime unit, would write a letter to the DPP director of public prosecutions and say, look, I know we won this case, but I've looked very carefully. I know he's going to appeal. We're going to lose. There's all kinds of mistakes. And the director of public prosecutions usually agreed with him because of his position. And eventually he got seven years for that. Goodness gracious. He got seven years and I got his job. So there you are. Right. Dave's got something to ask. When, when you were a director for public prosecution and also head of the commercial crime unit, those roles effectively serve the public interest. 
I'm, I'm sure there were many sleepless nights because of the decisions you were making on a daily basis. How did you eventually find a good night's sleep? Well, let me say, first of all, I was not director of public prosecutions. I was head of commercial crime, which had the title of assistant director of public prosecutions. That's right. But, you know, when you've got a... Uh, we had clever, we had some good people, you know, mainly at that time, Australia, New Zealanders from England, etc. And the ones I had in commercial crime tended to be the brighter ones, I have to say. And I knew I could rely on them. And I'd, I'd give them, you know, the work would come in from the police or the ICAC and uh, hand it out. Uh, and uh, it was usually my decision eventually. Uh, sometimes it was obvious that we had a case. Sometimes it was obvious that we didn't. Other times you just make the decision. But I managed to sleep. <laughs> That's good. Let's pivot now to, uh, to your career, Clive, at the, at the Hong Kong Bar. Leaving public service and entering private practice at the Hong Kong Bar, what was that like as a, as a junior barrister at that time, before you took Silk? Well, no, in fact, I took Silk when I was in the government. Oh, is that right? Okay. I became a Queen's Counsel while I was in the government. Right. Ten years. Fortunately for me, I'd won a couple of cases, which were big cases, in the Privy Council. And that helped. So well, I applied for Silk. I'll tell you a quick story about that. When I'd applied for Silk and the days when it was meant to, the results came out, I was at a conference in Las Vegas. And I checked the last day, I checked to see whether there was anything from London, from Hong Kong, nothing. I came back, flew in and I said to my secretary, uh, anything from the Chief Justice about, you know, the silks this year? She said, no. And about halfway through the morning, I get a call from the tailor saying, when are you coming in to get your silk gown? That's well, I haven't been told yet. Oh, yes, I can tell you, you have been. <laughs> so, uh, I've got silk uh, from the tailor. She knew in advance, yeah. <laughs> so you took silk while you were in public life, so to yes. speak. Yes, that, that's interesting because... I think in the UK and other jurisdictions, it t- tends to be when you're in, in private practice only. So that makes my question even um, even more interesting. You, you know, you're, you're in that environment, working in that in that public service environment. You come out into private practice as a silk. What was the biggest change for you? Well, can I just go slightly back as to why I went into Please. public service. Well, as I was deputy uh, DPP at the time, this was '94. And 1997, the handover, as we called it, to uh, from Britain to China was coming, and it was pretty clear that they wanted Chinese people in the top positions. That would be Attorney General, Director of Public Prosecution, and in fact, one of my jobs was to try and, you know, not recruit, but to advise who I thought should take my place. So I knew that I didn't have a great uh, any future there because by 97, I didn't have a post. So I came out. I had a reputation as a criminal lawyer because I'd been in the DPP. But very early on, I was very lucky and got a very big civil case, which got a lot of publicity. What had happened was when an English silk came here, he had to have a, a local silk as a junior. And the English silk who'd come was from Chancery, and he said to the solicitor, look, I don't do cross-examination, I don't do it. I want somebody who can cross-examine. So they went to court to see whether they could get a, another silk from England as a cross-examination. And the judge at the time, even before they went, they said, well, there's plenty of people here who can do it. Clive Grossman, he's just come into the government. He's crossing that. So my life has been full of lucky stories like that. Was that Edward Fitzgerald? No, it came later. It wasn't. It was a chap. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name now. But he was in Chancery, and it was a long case. It was to do with shipping. So not only did I have a very good case, but also a little bit about shipping law. But the problem was, of course which I was the only one who realized it, 
was I had a degree in Roman Dutch law. I had no degree uh, which was allowable in Hong Kong. I'd never done pupillage. I had nothing that allowed me here, but they seemed to think, oh, well, he's, got a, he's a silk, he's a, a member of the inner bar. I suppose that means he's a member of the outer bar also. So they allowed me. But I don't think they really understood that I wasn't... <laughs> still not. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll edit that bit out, uh, Ty. Okay. <laughs> so, so let me ask you then. You know, you, you come in and, like you say, these lovely, these you know, lucky breaks. Um, uh, you're able to prove yourself. What was the atmosphere like, and the environment like, in the, at the Hong Kong private Hong Kong bar? Then was it very competitive? Was it collegiate? I think it was collegiate and always has been collegiate. I was very lucky. As I say, I've had a lot of lucky breaks. And that is that I applied to the chambers, which is now called Parkside Chambers, and they had a spare room. And I've been in Parkside Chambers since the very, be almost since the very beginning. And there, I think we always picked the right people to come in. They were clever and very collegiate, as we call it. So I've always been surrounded by very clever people. Luckily for me, very clever juniors who can do the work I should be able to do. And very, you know, people that I like a lot. We've always had a good time here. People in Parkside Chambers have really been a superb company and superb people to work with. And, and let me ask you about uh, your style of working uh, as a silk. Do you work in big teams? Normally, I mean, things change, of course, depending on the case. One works, one has to have a junior as a silk, at least one junior. And that's either the junior has chosen me or I've chosen the junior. It depends. Uh, if there's an English silk, you mentioned Ed Fitzgerald, for instance, he would have, to, he's, when he comes here, he needs to have a, a local silk also in his team. And do you feel that working as a as a silk in a in a team that there's always one leader? It's a difficult question to answer because if I've got an English silk, they're usually very clever. They're the top people, and it depends on their personality as to whether there's one leader or not. But usually, one person, really the client, relies on more than anyone. While we're, while we're speaking about English silks coming in, is it is it becoming harder now for English silks to get admission in Hong Kong? I think it probably is. I, I don't have statistics or anything like that, but I think it probably is, simply because in the nature of things, we have more and more silks. And the standard here, and I talk about my colleagues, is pretty high. I know, I know in particular it is in Parkside Chambers. Yes, I'm sure it is. And what was, what is it like? I mean, in the in the court of final appeal, Hong Kong has got one of those interesting jurisdictions where, in your court of final appeal, you have foreign judges uh, who come in and sit. So, can I ask you what it's like? I mean, or how different it is appearing before local Hong Kong judges at one level, and then you know when it goes on appeal, you're before Lord Hoffman or Jonathan Sumption and the like. Well, of course. Uh it's only one foreign judge at a time. So there's five judges and four of whom are local and one, uh, as I say, one foreign judge. But it, it, it's comforting to the bar, I know, that an overseas judge can come and sit down and either agree or disagree with the majority, whatever it is. So there's never any question, as people seem to think sometimes, that that they will do what the government says they should do. It doesn't work like that at all. And we, as you say, we've had some great judges coming from, mainly from England, but also from Australia, Judge Gleeson, from Chief Justice of Canada came, Beverly McLaughlin, some very, very able judges. And do you prepare in any different way if you do have these, these uh, foreign judges in the final court of appeal? Exactly the same. No, exactly the same. So the Chief Justice is from Hong Kong, so they're just one of the five. Can I now turn to, to your methods and, and try to sort of divine a little bit about how you, how you work? Obviously, uh, being you know, from the criminal bar, cross-examination is, is 
it's got to be one of your strengths and you've done some of the biggest criminal work in, in Hong Kong. Tell us how you prepare for that. There's a very long version of this and a very short version. Because I, I lecture, I have been lecturing on cross-examination. But like anything else, and I suppose it's the same with just about anything that you do, preparation is the big word with a capital P. First of all, especially in commercial crime cases, of which I used to do a lot, uh, they get very complicated. I don't have a, a degree in economics. They're very complicated. And you have to make sure that you know, first of all, you understand the terminology in that type of case. But in an ordinary case, whether it's civil or criminal, you have to know every word. There's no word. There's no worse way than going in and the judge says, well, you just said X, but if you look at page 727, you'll see it says Y. Oh, yes, sorry, I didn't read that. That's the worst thing you can do. That's the worst thing you can do. So preparation with a capital P is the starting point. As far as cross-examination is concerned, when, when I, I, I lecture, or I used to lecture about it, I always say, look, you don't know you, the cross-examiner, doesn't know who's telling the truth. You've got your client's version. That's the one you have to rely on. Bear in mind, though, the person who's giving evidence against your client, probably the one time in his or her life would be doing that. Don't make it a horror story for them. First of all, if they don't, they start not to like you, they're not going to help be helpful to you. Be polite as you can, but make sure you can uh, cover every point. And if necessary, have an uh, anticipate every answer to every question that you're going to get. That's a very short version. But as I said, preparation with a capital P. P. Yeah. And and do you do you handwrite your questions in full, mm -hmm. or are they point form? Usually in point form, if it's questioning a person usually who's made a statement, I'll put the questions against the statement. That's the way I normally do it. Normally do it. Everybody's got their own way of doing it. But, you know, nowadays, and I, I'm not up to that, but most young barristers can type away, you know, like that, where I can barely know how to switch it on. Yeah. My pen has ink that comes from a bottle, Clive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, pen, um, yes, I use pencils. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, uh, and then let me let me just uh, uh, swivel from that and ask you about about written advocacy because I mean uh, uh, and I've seen some briefs that have come out, written submissions that have come out of, of Hong Kong uh, in the last ten years, and they are full and fulsome. What do you think of them? Of, of the of the reliance, such a heavy reliance now on on, on written work. I can look at this two ways. First of all. We're very lucky here that we have a, a reliance on, we don't, if we're not in England, we rely on United Kingdom cases. In Australia, Australian cases. Here, we rely on Australia, United Kingdom, New Zealand, and sometimes South Africa, depending on what the, the type of case is. So we have to do that uh, as far as that is concerned. But the other half of that question is or the other half of the answer is since COVID started, there's more and more distance uh, teaching, as it were. Mm. So, like here, well, I mean, this is what we're doing now. Yeah. But more and more cases are being done now on, on distance. So you have to understand, be able to deal with it, and also the filing of the filing of cases. I mean, here, this room, you know, you, can, well, you can't see it now, but before you take all the files to court, now judges say, we want everything online. They don't say that, but it's going in that direction. We want everything online. Now, which is, if you understand it, which I don't, means it's very much easier to find things, mark things, and it doesn't take up so much room. And also, the other thing is you can, you can do it at a distance. You can question witnesses in other countries and things like that. 
Um, but I, in terms of the written submissions itself, you know, the, 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 the final submissions, everything being in writing, I mean, there's a very heavy reliance on that. So let me ask you this question. I mean, you know, you've done this very full written submission for uh, a trial court after trial or, or an appellate court. How do you decide what you say in your oral submissions? The way that I do it, and I'm not saying everybody else does, or even if it's the best way that well, I do it, if I think I have a particularly good point, I might put it fairly shortly in my written submissions so that I can elaborate on it when I'm on my feet. That's what I do. Uh, otherwise, uh, what can be done is to say, I want to extend, I, I want to refer to paragraph so-and-so, and then you, 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 you elaborate it. After all, you can never write down everything that's in your mind. You just elaborate it. But I like to keep some things for the lot to tell the court, which they perhaps they haven't thought of before. That's that's really interesting. We've got we're coming to the end. We've got eight minutes, uh, eight minutes left, uh, Clive. And, I, and and look, you've done so many high-profile cases in Hong Kong, Fiji. We've had Mahendra uh, Chowdhury, you know, the police officers, Dong Yin Kit. You know, the, we could, the list goes on and on about the the, the high-profile cases that you've you've done. Do you treat them any differently from any other punter that walks into your chambers? Well, the easiest way is to say, no, I don't. But in fact, that's the truth. Because sometimes a simple two or three day case is going to be more complicated than very long ones. The very long ones, you can get used to it as you're going along. If it's very high profile, as quite a lot of them have been, you have to be aware of what might be quoted in the newspapers the next day. And also, if you've got family from one side or the other, there, you know, the accused family or the family, I think you have to be a little careful, simply as a human being, uh, as to the way you speak. But generally, uh, one tries to be as neutral as you can, saying simply, well, isn't it obvious that my case is right, you know, without shouting and performing? Judges don't like it. It doesn't happen. Yes. And of those high-profile cases, some of them have come, you know, after 97 and they're, they're sort of difficult yes. democracy cases. Is there one that stands out for you? Well, I did act for a woman called Nina Wang. Yes, I know the case well. Yeah, I would do you good. Well, she was the wealthiest woman in in uh, Asia. And what had happened was a husband had been kidnapped about 10 years previously. And she paid $50 million, which was a lot of money even then, uh, on a ransom. But she never got him back. But she maintained he was alive and being held by his father in Taiwan. Many, many years previous to that, he'd written a will in which he left everything to his father. Because I think in those days, you didn't think women could handle big, big companies. And she always maintained he was alive. After he'd been missing for seven years, the father came up and brought an action, which you could do after seven years, to say, have him declared dead. He fought it, and she lost. And she said to the judge, all right, well, you decided my husband is dead. He's uh, a couple of years before he disappeared. He gave me an envelope there only to be opened after my death. You said he's dead. Here it is. And in it was a will that left everything to her, amongst other things. The case that I liked so much was the decision whether or not to decide whether or not the will was forged. That decide, depended on various things, and in particular on the age of the ink. Because if the ink was, wasn't more than seven years old, if it was less than that, she must have had it forged. And she, she engaged me to do that part. And she sent me to Ottawa, Canada, to learn about 
and it was her expert against our expert. And I spent days cross-examining their expert on the nature of ink and the age of ink and how you told. And it worked out successfully for her. But that's why I always remember that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was very, very electric, that case. Clive, in terms of, and I think I probably know the answer to this, but between the forensics and sort of the legal scholarship, which one do you enjoy more? Well, I was never very good at science, which never why I didn't become a doctor. So I had to study it very hard, but I found it easier to study the law or the legal aspects of it. I just want to know in terms of addressing a judge and a jury, how do you develop different approaches to both of those audiences and you maintain the same? Well, uh, as far as the jury is concerned, I always make sure that I don't use long words or unnecessary words. In Hong Kong, the juries had to had passed English at high school level, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are absolutely fluent in, in English. And I usually tell witnesses to do the same. Don't use long words. Furthermore, it's what, when you address a judge, you're talking, you're talking about law. Because the, law, the judge is going to uh, direct the jury on legal matters. Uh, with the jury you, talk, your jury, you talk facts. As simple as that. And try and use as simple language as you can. So that's a simple answer to your difficult question. <laughs> Always the best, a simple answer. Clive, we now come to the, the closing round, which we call the rapid fire round, where we just pose a question, you just give us a, a, a quick answer, one word if you can, and if you need a few more, fine, but uh, it's called rapid fire. So the first one is, if there is a case you would go back and re-argue, which one would it be? Wouldn't. I wouldn't. I thought of that. The answer is no. Excellent. Second, what do you enjoy most in practice, the intellectual exercise or the interpersonal skills? I enjoy the friendship of my colleagues and the uh, application of knowledge. Who is the opponent that you respected the most? Is that in Hong Kong? Anywhere. Well, going back to Zimbabwe, I've mentioned Chris Anderson. Here, it would be uh, people like Graham Harris, Graham Harris, yes. Graham Harris. In your career, uh, Clive, who did you learn from the most? Well, I'll just give you names in Hong Kong. Frank Stock, Michael Hartman, and in Zimbabwe, Benny Golden. And the judge who challenged you the most? I'd say Frank Stock, Michael Hartman again. Really? Gosh. And what is, in your mind, the single most important quality that an advocate should possess? Honesty. Tell us, describe a, a day in the life of, a life of, uh, of Clive Grossman today. Well, can I say first of all, I'm almost completely retired. But uh, so it doesn't... Uh, well, tell, give, tell us about a day in the life of when you were at the bar and tell us a day in the life of now. When I was at the bar, I would come in usually at about 7, 7.30, have a cup of collie, a coffee with a colleague, and then go to court. Uh, if I wasn't in court, I'd be working on the next day's case or day after that. After court, go and sit, sit down with the client, and we talk about what had happened during the day and what we've, we anticipate for the following day. Now... I'm a morning person, so I come in in the morning to chambers to see my annoy my friends, and I watch rugby and I watch cricket. Ah, okay. <laughs> so is that what you do during your time off to enjoy yourself, rugby and cricket? I read a lot. I do watch cricket and rugby, but I, I'm a reader. I read very fast, probably a book a day. My goodness. Well. Clive Grossman, SC, thank you so very much for being with us on, on Advocates, the podcast. That has been a fascinating hour. Well, I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks for your questions, which have really stirred my memory, I have to say. Thank you for listening to Advocates, the podcast. 
If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode and tag us. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you. Listen to the voices of the advocate.